Welcome to Nick and Dave Deep Dive the Metaverse, a podcast exploring cult classics, subculture, and geek media. I'm Nick. And I'm Dave. And we will be your tour guides for this deep dive of James Cameron's 1986 science fiction action horror, Aliens, uh, part two of our James Cameron Imperial Phase series. Yeah, this one's pretty cool. James Cameron uh, picks up after Ridley Scott Mm -hmm. created this, uh, this IP, this franchise. Yeah. And it's uh, it's been at least twenty years since I saw this movie. Yeah, um, I was I was I, thinking, I haven't gone back to the Aliens movies at all, really. I was thinking that too. The last time I can remember watching this was uh, when I briefly worked at Suncoast, the motion picture company. Mm. Even though this is an R-rated film, we would demo it and play it in the store because nice. it was a bunch of irresponsible youths working there. Yeah, I mean, this is this is really great, and I and I really enjoy this franchise. Like mm-hmm. the Aliens franchise is awesome. I even liked Prometheus. I love Prometheus. Um, I want more from this franchise. Yeah. I wish that he had gone ham on this rather than Blue Man Group. Uh, it's just... <laughs> you mean Cameron, not not Ridley Scott? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. Um, Ridley Scott has been back a couple times. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's... Uh... <laughs> it would be i think the thing is avatar is that's james cameron's baby and this yeah, is ridley this scott's is, baby this is ridley scott's baby and, and, and cameron's just babysitting it for <laughs> for one it's movie. sad but i mean this movie made a lot of money it mm-hmm. was budgeted for 18 and a half million and it made upwards of 183 million yeah uh that's a lot almost 10 times the budget so I mean that's huge. I uh, I you don't see a lot of uh, movies that get ten times the budget. That's pretty insane. It is. There's a lot of crazy. Th- James Cameron's career is just crazy because you would think that he got this film off the strength of Terminator, mm-hmm. but he they sought him out to write this film just from seeing the Terminator script. That's oh wow! It so, wasn't it wasn't like the fish movie or whatever. Yeah, the, the, the piranha. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So someone they wanted to do a sequel to Alien, and someone at 20th Century Fox had read the Terminator script, mm-hmm. and they were like, "This guy should do it." And so they contacted him to write a treatment, and that's what he was doing in that that lull in the Terminator production where Arnold was making Conan the Destroyer. Oh, he was writing this. James Cameron was writing Alien. Yeah, this guy is really interesting because he uh, he writes a lot of his stuff and he, he gets a lot of inspiration from his own dreams. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I think that's pretty cool. I, I like that he's a, a super creative guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, not that most directors aren't super creative, but I just think that um, James Cameron... Uh, really kind of goes above and beyond when it comes to uh, creating original content, not just adapting uh, existing story. Yeah, it's he. I think he has a screenplay credit on basically all of his films. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so he is uh, quite a tyrant. Like if you get into the the background on this film, he clashed a lot with the the British crew at at Pinewood. Yeah, he, uh, he did that on another film too, right? I think uh, the uh, I think the Abyss is also yeah. a very contentious set. He really he doesn't like the 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 British like the the film unions and stuff yeah, yeah. and their their mandatory tea breaks and all of that really uh, gets under his skin for some reason. Yeah, it's it, it does seem weird to me that they have such weird breaks and stuff. Like I I, I mean I'm all for organized labor and whatnot, but mm-hmm. at a certain point the job has to get done. Yeah, you can't be a detriment to to actually finishing the work. Yeah, they just um they just have a different system than just we do different pace of work yeah they it's a little it's a shorter work day i guess mm-hmm. than than it is in the states a shorter shooting day um with more mandated breaks and yeah so there was a lot of clashing with between james cameron and the brits who had all worked on alien with ridley scott oh, okay uh who was a british director and and he was in their system yeah much more culturally acclimated to them um so it's it's interesting though because out of that tension, I think a really great movie came. So. Yeah, it, it definitely was was uh, I enjoyed this movie, but we'll get into into that in a bit. Let's go ahead and roll for initiative. Okay, eight. 
Uh, I got a one. Whoa. So I don't I'm, even get to deliver any news. Uh, yeah, you, you <laughs> critical fail. So this is just Dave's segment. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's start with the Dungeons and Dragons uh, drama. Okay. D&D and D. &D. I've, been, um, I've been waiting to hear about this. <laughs> yeah. So or at the, least your take on it. The open gaming license saga. Mm -hmm. um, so after they put out... Uh, kind of a mea culpa like we're sorry we won't we're, we won't do that to you we're gonna put out this draft and a survey and see what everybody has to say and mm -hmm. you know lots of people did the survey and then they basically said well almost nobody likes most of these provisions it's like 80 percent plus we're against it yeah. um they just decided all right we're just gonna go back and we're gonna take that ogl 1.0 at 1.0a so the existing one that lets mm -hmm. people make D, D content uh D, D compatible content i should say yeah have we explained what that is i think we did last episode yeah i think so yeah. basically just you can add, if you want to make your own campaign setting or you want to make um adventures or mm -hmm. whatever you can you can do it you, there's just a few things that are actually there uh their intellectual property that aren't considered like just sort of general fantasy genre, like things yeah. like beholders are mm -hmm. owned by Watsy because that was created by D and D same mm -hmm. with, um, uh, mind flayers and owl bears. Mm -hmm. They're these specific monsters really. Yeah. Um, anyway, so they decided, okay, we're going to go back and we're going to institute this. The old gaming license is going to stay in effect forever. And we're going to take the SRD, which is the systems reference document, which mm -hmm. is the core rules of the game. Right. And they're going to transfer them to the Creative Commons, which is a nonprofit that holds and defends uh, open license IPs. Oh, wow. So now uh, Watsi won't even have control over the SRD or the open gaming license, they will be controlled by the Creative Commons. So even if they wanted to revoke them or take them back, they can't. They're they're uh, surrendering them over willingly, so that it's it's kind of like a um, like a political move, saying, "Hey, look, now this is this is forever uh, open content. We couldn't revoke it if we wanted to." Okay. And so that's a huge victory for the nerds, um, the, the, the why haters. Are, why are they still angry, Dave? <laughs> uh, they're, well, they're still angry for two reasons. Okay. Uh, one is that they're shitty. <laughs> um, <laughs> they won, and they're just shitty winners. Um, yeah. And that's <laughs> just the way it is, because they say things like, um, but they used up all their goodwill that they ever had with this shenanigans. Uh, it's like, uh, come on, coattail rider. Uh, <laughs> you need to get back with the program because D and D is still the number one tabletop RPG in the world. Yeah. Um, and then the other one is there is actually uh, there is actually something to be mad about for a very small group of the population, and some people are mad on their behalf. Okay. So the open gaming license does not cover. It virtual tabletops because they didn't exist when this happened when okay. this when the open gaming license was uh, created and if you don't know what a virtual tabletop is it's basically software that lets you play D&D across the world with other people you have a shared battle map you move your mm. minis around it okay. rolls dice for you um, and most of the time it's paired with a voice client. So you're talking in the thing, roll 20 being the most popular of the okay, virtual right. tabletops. Um, so they basically, it, it never covered virtual tabletops and op the OGL 1.2, the revised shitty version of the open game and license did cover virtual tabletops. Okay. So Watsi was like, okay, we'll go under the new old rules. But we're revoking all these licenses that we issued independently to like Roll20 and other groups to like Foundry. There's a couple more yeah. to run virtual tabletop versions of D&D using our content because those were never covered in okay. the original open gaming license. They were later independently licensed. So the reason they're doing this is very clear they are creating their own virtual tabletop that they're going to publish right. and it's going to be the it's going to be the big dog it will be the only official one and so the only way you can play virtually is if you use the official one which will cost you money mm -hmm. like a subscription right. like the current subscription for D&D &D Beyond which is not a virtual tabletop but it's the next step right. it will it will expand into that it's like $5 if you're just a player account or $10 if you're a DM that lets you 
you share all your content with okay. other people. So five or 10 bucks. Um, and so you'll have the choice, play digitally and pay them or use some bullshit hodgepodge uh, gray market solution mm -hmm. for free, which will be more hassle than it's worth unless you're like a teenager with no money. Yeah. Uh, or, it's like paying uh, for Spotify rather than pirating music. Yeah. It's just easier. It And, and that $5 or as long as you keep it under 10 that's a sort of yeah. uh, a forgettable monthly charge that yeah. lots of people... It's like a $5 Patreon. You just do it. You just do it and just never think about it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so I think... <sighs> people are still salty about that. Yeah, they're that. salty about that, but I don't use a VTT, so I don't really care. I don't know anyone... I do know one person that does, and mm -hmm. he's he'll he's an adult. He'll just pay the price like everybody else. So yeah, I just think it's a weird thing that people are still mad at them when the nerds won. They it, totally, uh, they totally vanquished Hasbro yeah. by thirty thousand people canceling their D and D Beyond subscriptions and costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars per month. They're like, okay, we cave, yeah, re resubscribe, please. Yeah, and probably, <laughs> you know, just the nature of leaks. Probably the leaked document. Um, you could easily see it as just testing the water. Like, what will oh, people yeah. do if we they do might this? They might have self-leaked. They might have self-leaked it. That's very plausible. Um, or a disgruntled employee. Or, you know, there's lots of mm -hmm. reasons leaks happen. But, you know, as I'm, I mean, I'm a gamer, but, like, I'm, I'm a little removed from the community. Sure. This whole thing seemed very weird to me. And then when, uh, when Wizards came out with their statement, it felt very reasonable, normal, intellectual property copyright law sort of stuff mm -hmm. um all publishers protect their their intellectual yeah it's their, so their, weird their, it's the the sense of entitlement just sort of baffles me it does it, it is insane it would be like if people were running um running like game of thrones um add-on content mm -hmm. fanfic but they were they were making profit by it yeah that's the and, part that's crazy and, yeah and they're making an entire business out of it and then like a cobalt press yeah and then martin's publisher comes in is like um no you can't because we're tired of you being our competitor mm -hmm. and they're like how dare you <laughs> <laughs> it's like wait a minute yeah. you don't own shit <laughs> yeah it is it's it's not i mean i think it's it's great that the the homebrew community and all that stuff exists mm -hmm. and that they encourage that but it actually is fairly insane to me that that these things like other publishers publish books and sell them yeah. using the system like, there's a star wars game a star wars d20 game because the newest star wars tabletop role-playing game mm -hmm. is not d20 system based right so there's a d20 star wars game that you can get online that is to it's a fan community and mm -hmm. it's very polished yeah and you can get the whole pdf and they have a whole like really great interactive website and it's really strong and it's never been shut down why Nobody makes a cent. Yeah. It's a passion project. It's all Star Wars. The mouse hasn't stomped it. This mm -hmm. is literally promotion for their IP yeah. that nobody makes money from. Yeah. It's, I mean. If they were going after people like that and suing them, it would be that would lame. be a different thing. But like just protecting. Like I'm a home brewer. I have yeah. shit on my website. Yeah. So anyways, yeah, I... I've been following this thing and kind of waiting for your take on it. So that's yeah, interesting. I'm, I'm glad they came back on it because I'm a huge Critical Role fan mm -hmm. and they have books published under Open Gaming License. They I'm have huge, both, right? Like, yeah, they have official and unofficial. Yeah. Like I love MCDM, uh, Matt, the Matt Colville's uh, company that mm -hmm. makes games under uh, OGL. I'm a big fan of the third party communities and I have bookshelves full of shit. Yep. But I don't think they have a entitlement to someone else's ip yeah see seems very reasonable we probably this will be the some of our most controversial takes on this podcast <laughs> Yeah, because we're against the nerds <laughs> all right so what's up with you uh your, so your news my first news i don't have a ton of news but my first one is the deep dive the meta bump strikes again Ooh. because my film of the year last year that uh, everything everywhere all at once has is leading the Oscar nominations race, 11 nominations. Wow. Uh, that's Best Picture, Best Director for uh, the directing duo of the Daniels, uh, Best uh, Original Screenplay, Best Actress nomination for Michelle Yeoh, 
uh, Best Supporting Actress nominations for uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and Stephanie Hsu, and a Best Supporting Actor uh, for Kihi Kwan. And um, I love that movie, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I want them to win every award. That's cool. That's yeah. awesome. So when is it time for them to drop the gendered categories? Oh, you know, I wonder about that because so many people don't well, say actress anymore. And the, yeah, they use the term actor uh-huh. and there's non-binary actors. But and... if they did that, um, I mean, like half the amount of people would, 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 win, win, aw- yeah. would win awards. So I think in this case, I don't think there's a big movement to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. Um but I have wondered about that as more and more people just want to use the the non-gendered term. Yeah, that seems weird to me. Yeah. No, I don't know. All right. So I got a p- another piece of news. Okay. This one won't take as long to explain. It's a critical role. Legend of Vox Machina season two is premiered. Mm-hmm. If you like cartoons about fantasy, this is the thing. Uh, the first six episodes have dropped by now. They dropped them three last yeah, week. Yeah, I watched the three first three. this week. Okay. Yeah, so there's three new ones out. And they were great. The, this uh, meta plot is about the Chroma Conclave, which is a conclave of evil dragons. And Evil dragons. I think misunderstood okay, dragons. Yeah. We would call them uh, morally ambiguous dragons. No, these are pretty evil dragons. Yeah, they're straight up destroy the capital of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, the heroes have to go around and uh, collect the vestiges of a divergence, which are basically artifacts from a forgotten age. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll use those to defeat the bad guys. That's the, that's the, as the plot is explained in episode two, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really great. It's super fun. Uh, and if you like season one, you'll love season two. Uh, I think this look like there maybe is a budget increase or something. Oh, yeah. Cause this looks gorgeous. Well, and also, uh, speaking of like increase, uh, Critical Role signed a licensing agreement, um, like an across the board licensing agreement with Amazon mm-hmm. for all of their IPs, and they greenlit another animated series about the Mighty Nine, which mm-hmm. was Campaign Two. Um, and I actually think Campaign Two will make a better TV show than Campaign One. I I understand there is a lot of people f- feel that's the the best. Team. It's, it's, the it's best really lineup. good. Yeah, like the the character lineup is amazing. Um, and the thing is, is when Campaign One started, they started it like at home and they converted it to a streaming show, and yeah. it went kind of gonzo. Uh, Campaign Two was started when they were already veteran streamers, and so Matt, the DM, he wrote it uh, with the idea that this is going to be like a meta plotted out. Um, like episodic mm-hmm. entertainment show that is also D and D for his friends, yeah. and so this will this this one will have a lot more. It, it'll be a lot tighter. You'd say, I'd say. Okay. Um, and so I think it's going to be awesome. They also have uh, movie rights. They're, they they have first option movie rights for all this stuff, and I'm stoked for the nerd community because. Uh, more cool Titmouse animation mm-hmm. for uh, for nerd IP is great. Yeah, no, I uh, I haven't watched the the second the second three episodes, but I just binged through those first three. Oh yeah, they're yeah. so quick to watch, yeah. and then it's fun to watch the recaps and stuff on YouTube, mm-hmm. and all of that. All right, so what else you got? So my next news item: uh, Deadline is reporting that uh, Robert Egg. Eggers is once again looking to cast Willem Dafoe in his upcoming project. It's a remake of uh, Nasratu. And, um, you know, this is starring uh, Lily Rose Depp, uh, Bill Skarsgård, I believe, as Count Orlock. Um, and it's still unclear what, what character Defoe would be playing in this. Um, but Defoe was in The Lighthouse and he was in uh, The Viking, mm-hmm. or The Northman, excuse me. Um, so, Eggers and Defoe obviously have a good creative partnership. And I think it's an interesting thing because Willem Defoe played a fictionalized version of Max Schreck, who was the actor that played the vampire yeah. in Nosferatu. Um, so there's just like an interesting, interesting thing going on there. So I'm really looking forward to this movie. Um, Eggers is, it's been kind of his white whale. He's wanted to remake Nosferatu for a while. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm down. Totally. What do you got? And I got one more. Okay. Sh- it's a shorty. 
Um, Mandalorian season three finally has a formal release date. That's March first, mm-hmm. and they dropped a trailer that is juicy. That trailer is good. It's got so much cool shit. Like he's going back to Mandalore. We get some lightsabers, so we know there'll be some Jedi. There's lots of Mandalorians. Mm-hmm. He meets up with the blacksmith, um, or what's her name? Is is it the blacksmith? I think it's the blacksmith. And, yeah. And he says he's going back to get redemption mm-hmm. and. It's him and Grogu rolling around in their sports car, <laughs> uh, speeder ship. Yeah, it's just awesome. It, that that uh, that trailer got me hyped. It did. Um, it's uh, you know I wax and wane on the Mandalorian because I think it. I think people like it's not as good as people make it out to be, in my opinion. But I do love it all the same. It's like the best Star Wars content. No, Andor. Andor. I did watch all of Andor. Yeah. Andor pretty good. Andor's incredible. I just think that the Mandalorian is more entertaining. The Mandalorian is more fun. It's like it's it has its moments where mm-hmm. it's a little fun, mm-hmm. but I don't think the Andor was um I don't think the Andor was perfect. It was four star content. Oh no. I yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Um so I don't have any more news. It's me a light either. week for me. So All yeah. right, what's our podcast fuel? Our podcast fuel, once again, we're going to our, our friends at Gigantic Brewing Company in Portland, Oregon. If they were really our friends that sponsor our podcast. I know, and we'd only <laughs> and we would only drink gigantic yes. beers. Um and so I got one of their Project Pilsner beers. This is the Galaxy Pilsner, as we're doing a space-themed sci-fi movie. Um, and their Project Pilsner is uh, they it's a reinterpret where they reinterpret the classic German-style Pilsner for the Pacific Northwest, and they do that by using Pacific Northwest hops. This time, Galaxy. And so it's a bright citrusy lager with notes of kumquat and passion fruit. And it's a 5.2 ABV. So that's pretty sessionable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this is this is pretty delicious. Yeah, it's a really good beer. Uh, I opened it and I uh, took a drink and was like, okay, this is great. <laughs> uh, so very good beer. All right. Why don't we take a break and dive into this? Welcome back, divers. Let's dive into Aliens, 1986, directed by James Cameron. So this, uh, you want to do this synopsis? Sure. I got, I, got, I kind of did a, almost a beat by beat. I made my synopsis way too long. So okay. you can go mine's, ahead and mine's I'll, tight. Fill, I'll fill in some Mine's stuff. tight, yeah. 57 years after the events of Alien, final girl Ellen Ripley is discovered by deep, deep space scrappers still in hypersleep. When she wakes up, she learns that the Wayland yutani Corporation is much more concerned with the loss of a valuable space freighter than they are with her stories of a parasitic alien. However, after losing contact with the colony on the planet where Ripley's crew picked up their bug problem in the first place, Ripley is pressed into service as an advisor to a squad of colonial marines that are being sent to investigate. Yeah, so, I mean, that's that's definitely pretty tight. And so this is an interesting, uh, I mean, that's like the premise. The This is a, this is a, starts off as a horror movie mm-hmm. combined with, with the military flick, yeah, it's got some. It's got some like uh, Full Metal Jacket vibes. It's um, the they they say over and over again. Uh, both uh, producer Galen Hurd and James Cameron call it a Vietnam War movie. Yeah, I mean it's it's really a Vietnam movie uh, with this squad of Marines mm-hmm. and they've got their two civvies along with them. Yeah, and um, and I I love the I love how they they genre bend here yeah. kind of like they did in terminator yeah um so this this is you know i mean we're still in the synopsis but basically like yeah they have to go and investigate and they find aliens go mm-hmm. figure there's a there's a girl little girl that survives who they pick up and um they they are able to uh, you know they're they're fighting these these aliens and there's a queen and yeah. that becomes the main monster antagonist mm-hmm. and so at a certain point in the movie it segues from like a war 
war flick slash uh, creeping horror mm-hmm. into a, just a full-throated action movie. Yeah, totally. Um, it turns the corner on that, and it just uh, it just never really lets off the gas until the very end. And you watched you watched the theatrical cut, yes, correct? I yes, I did. So I watched the theatrical, and then I watched today. I watched uh, the extended edition, which is the version that I I kind of grew up with was the mm-hmm. extended edition, and they both play great. I think um, the theatrical cut is faster. Like it's it's much more of a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, the extended edition just stretches things out and it's more suspenseful. Mm-hmm. Um, but both of them play awesome. Like I don't think one is greater than the other one. Yeah, I mean, I I have a lot to say about this movie because I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I thought it was I thought it was really cool. I like. Um, I like aliens. I like space. I mm-hmm. like soldier stuff. I, you know, it's just got, it's got so much stuff in here. And yeah. I was, I was really, uh, I was really happy to see, you know, familiar faces, uh, like Michael Bain. Yeah. Um, Bean. Bean, my dad. <laughs> uh, and, and I was, uh, you know, like there was just some really great acting in here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul Reiser's awesome. Lance Hendrickson is great. Yeah. Um, so I just thought this, this was a, this was pretty cool. Let's get into our, our fir- yeah, into the let's storytelling. Go with our storytelling. Go yeah. ahead. Um, you know, once again, I think Cameron's his sense of pace and storytelling is just tremendous. He's um, he's really good at telling. Uh, his stories have like a mythic quality. They're very uh, epic feeling. I don't, I don't really know how to quantify it, mm-hmm. but it always like James Cameron movies are always an event. Like. Uh, yeah. And it just has the sense of uh, import to it, you know. It's like it's some you're watching something. <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, like I said, I watched the theatrical first, and then today I watched uh, the extended edition. And like I said, I think both of them are paced excellently. All right. I mean, I I was looking at this and I was seeing some interesting interesting kind of. Uh, tension building. One of the things mm-hmm. I liked about his storytelling is that he did a really he he's really good at doing a build up. Yeah. Um. I was, I was a little bit. I I did think that it was a little bit of a slow build for yeah. an action move, a sci fi action, which I is what I was expecting. Right. You know, like it kind of has vibes like Predator, how it's that's a Vietnam War movie plus yeah, totally. plus an alien. Um, and it took a long time for that tension to build. But as as I was watching, I was like, okay, this is this is extremely methodical. This mm-hmm. is this is put together like like by a technician of a story. And so it he's, really is. He's pulling strings and he's doing these things. And and I I, I started to appreciate that uh, more as I went. And this this was the same with the Terminator. He everything is laid out. And is going to be used later, right? Like, yeah. Like, it's set up when Ripley gets decommissioned uh, and she can't be a flight officer anymore. She gets a job, like, basically working in the loading docks. Yeah. And so she's using the power loader. And then we see the power loaders in action later, and then she uses it. And then, of course, it pays off in, in the, the climax of the film. And the way that well, camera... Spoiler, she fights the alien queen in, in the power loader. A mecha yeah. power armor yeah. loader suit. And so it's like everything there's no real throwaway anything in a james cameron movie everything is there so that he can pick that piece up again later in the movie yeah otherwise he cuts it yeah i mean it's it makes if it wasn't important it doesn't make it into the movie yeah i I like that i i um i mentioned it before in the synopsis Mm -hmm. i think that his storytelling here this could have been a fairly cold movie um about you know aliens it could have been and by that i mean impersonal yeah Uh, but i think he actually really made this feel like like a buddy movie like i cared about the members of the squad um i cared about uh ripley and yeah. um, even even Newt. Oh yeah. Even uh, even the child. Even the child. I, I think that they did a good job with all of these characters. Mm-hmm. That kid remind me of the little boy from uh, Mad Max. Oh yeah, I can see that because <laughs> it's. I think <laughs> it's a lot quiet, the, the dirty, big blonde yeah. hair too. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll talk more about the Marines when we get to the performances. But yeah, the way all the characters are introduced. Um, well, you said earlier, methodical is a good way to put mm-hmm. it. Um, you know, we 
we uh, we meet Paul Reiser's character Burke uh, fairly early on. He's one of the first main characters that we meet. Yeah, and and he know, doesn't seem too bad. He, seems he doesn't like seem a yeah. decent guy. Yeah, and the and and people are just kind of introduced naturally, and we don't get big expedition exposition dumps about people. We just get senses of their characters by the way they interact with each other. Yeah. I should have known that he was not a good guy because he works for a corporation. Yeah. It's it is pretty telling. And he and he 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 (laughs) straight up says it like the first time we we meet him, even though that scene is actually a nightmare. Um he says he's like, oh I work for the corporation, but don't worry, I'm still a good guy. And it's like no one that tells you that a good guy is going to be a good guy in the yeah, end. Yeah, like I'm a nice lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there's there's public defense That's attorneys. That's true. There's yeah. the ACLU. Yeah. So there is nice lawyers. <laughs> they just don't make any money. Well, and they normally don't have to go and give an excuse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I I think that uh, I I think that that character building and that like mm-hmm. foreshadowing everything is definitely some expert level storytelling and, uh, and directing. I don't really have anything more for the storytelling, uh, spot because I mean, it really just feels like James Cameron is using building blocks here mm-hmm. and he's, he's doing it expertly. Yeah. I'm my one more shout out of the storytelling is Ray Lovejoy's editing. Mm-hmm. Um, because I just think this movie flows beautifully like yeah there's none of those weird like uh like t- even terminator which i i really loved had some weird edits in it i mm-hmm. felt like really abrupt edits this is a smooth movie like it's a well-oiled machine of a, of a movie yeah it kind of remind me a little bit of how blade runner is edited yeah 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 it's that's really a- smooth and brisk uh in its edits even when there are slow ass scenes yeah i think that's a good call out because i do you think there's a certain level of homage to Ridley Scott being that it's a sequel to his mm-hmm. film? Um, and it's still very Cameron-y. Like, the, the the way scenes are composed and everything, they don't feel like Ridley, so- Ridley Scott compositions. They look like James Cameron. But you'd have no trouble believing this is in the same world as Blade Runner and Alien. Yeah. It's very cyberpunky. It's very noir um, it's got that same that same feeling, for sure. All right, so let's get on to visuals, which mm-hmm. is cine- cine- cinematography, production, design, etc. Yeah. So I really feel like this, for, especially for 1986, this was a visual effects bonanza. Oh yeah, this was just there's so much going on, um, when, and more than you even realize. As I watched behind the scenes stuff, yeah. th- scenes that I didn't think were effect shots are very complicated effect shots and it's like whoa one of the things i loved about the way this movie looked Mm -hmm. um i couldn't put my finger on it like i was i I was writing my notes like before i watched any of the james cameron interviews and i was i was kind of beating around the bush but he actually had a perfect word for it he made it something called a used future. Mm. Everything's yeah. used. Everything's dusty. There's dirt on things. Everything's kind of worn. This isn't a crispy, clean, like, uh, like br- brand new, squeaky, clean, nice future. This is very used. Mm-hmm. It's uh, there are people smoking everywhere. Yeah. There's kind of a patina on every metal surface. Yeah. And I just love that vibe because it feels so real. Yeah. It's- it's what gives everything that lived in feeling. And it's part of the reason why uh, people love classic Star Wars and reject the prequels. Oh, yeah. Is because the original Star Wars trilogy is like that. It's an it's an old, weathered universe. Yeah. And then uh, the Star Wars prequels where everything's CG and video game-y looking, it's like, you know, this doesn't feel like Star, yeah, Star Wars. Star Wars is dirty. a grit filter? Yeah. Star Wars is rougher than this. Yeah. And yeah, that's used future is a, is a great way to describe it. Um, it's very much in that cyberpunk style. We haven't even, yeah. we have not left our cyberpunk series. Basically yeah, it's ongoing. Much that, that movie, <laughs> this movie, I mean, this is like cyberspace punk, mm-hmm. uh, but it is so cyberpunk. I love how everything just kind of has that, um, 
that beat down it has a ridley scott look yeah you know like and, and that's really cool and then the the adding the vietnam uh military vibe mm -hmm. all of that is very used like full metal jacket yeah. or any of those movies so um it just kind of it had a it had a really unified look that felt realistic even though i knew those were sets mm -hmm. it legitimately looked like a spaceship yeah. uh, cargo hold where yeah. marines would be yeah and a lot of that um and a lot of the models and stuff uh as well uh, that uh, robert and dennis skotak built for this um pinewood studios in the uk is you know a huge movie studio where like you know every everyone shoots everything there in the uk mm -hmm. um they tend to at least back then burn their old shit like after after a production they had like a big burn pile outside and the skotax went and got wheelbarrows full of the burned debris from used movie sets and stuff nice. like that and then used that for set dressing around on their stuff so like that's why everything is sooty and like there's you know decrepit shit all over the streets and everything yeah. out there on the that's colonies awesome. it's all real debris and it just it gives everything that sense of being a, a real lived in universe. Yeah. I was noticing also, um, that there's a lot, there are a lot of vehicles in this movie mm -hmm. and they look really good. Yeah. The loader. I mean, that's so awesome. That, that is, that is like magic considering that it's not CG. Yeah. Um, the, and I really liked I liked the um, the APC the the yeah. the marine truck <laughs> yeah. that's zooming around. It's super badass. Um, and the ships looked really convincing. Mm -hmm. um, and I liked how they they thought of everything all the way down to like their her tiny apartment with its low ceilings. Like yeah. it's like t hashtag tiny house. Like yeah. uh, it it was so. It was so uh, realistic looking. Like it seems like that is definitely something that someone would have designed legitimately. Yeah, and it's um, you get no one ever says anything about it because I really love that scene because it's obviously like sort of project housing or whatever. Yeah, because it's like there's graffiti, there's graffiti stuff. in the hallway and like kind of trash in in the hall, and you see when Burke and the, and um, and the Marine Lieutenant come in there, they're both sort of like, they have that sense, like I'm, I'm on the wrong side of the tracks. And this is like Corbin Dallas's apartment. Yeah. Or, <laughs> um, like when you start or out, dread. when you start out in uh, cyberpunk, oh, right? Yeah, for the, sure. the first apartment you have, yeah, yeah, it's like, it's like that. And, and no one ever says like, Oh, this is where you're staying Ripley. Like no one says that you just get it from how people are acting. Yeah, they're like, oh, yeah, she's down on her luck. She has a crappy job. That's why we can compress her to to, to go re-go re into her trauma that she just escaped from. Yeah. Um, my first, the first thing that I highlighted in, in this section is Stan Winston is just off the chain in this movie. Um, all, all of this stuff, he takes H.R. Giger's original designs and simplifies them so that the xenomorph can be more dynamic and bestial. Yeah. Like they can move a lot more than the than the xenomorph moved in the original alien where it's very fiberglassy and stiff. Um and you know, and Cameron has this great eye for technical design too. Like he designed the power loader and the alien queen. Oh yeah. Um and his illustrations are gorgeous. Like he's he's such a good uh, concept artist and and storyboarder like he's he's really like i don't know quadruple threat or something <laughs> he, he can do everything but act in the movie yeah he could probably figure that out too <laughs> I definitely do think that the monster effects in this movie are insane. Like yeah. I love the face huggers. Yeah. I love the uh, I love the the smaller xenomorphs that come in through the ceiling and all of that. And it, you know, it becomes like a shooting gallery. Yeah, it's really cool. And then the queen is insane. She's a little herky jerky compared to the little ones. Yeah, but she's very very. Um, like frightening it's this legitimate horror show and it's wild to it's so that i guess you'd call it a suit or a pup i guess it's a puppet yeah but it's got two guys in it back to back wow um because one guy's operating her legs because she has the reversed legs yeah, yeah and then the other guy's operating the arms and it's just i mean 
the coordination it takes between the two puppeteers to make that they thing work. They should hire those guys that work in like Chinese dragons or mm-hmm. the, the food dog <laughs> puppets. Yeah, <laughs> it's wild. And um, I noticed, so Stan Winston has uh, the second unit director credit. Mm-hmm. So I imagine all of those scenes like you talk about of the aliens crawling through the tunnels and everything, mm-hmm. that's just Stan Winston shooting that stuff. So yeah. he's he's got some he's got some chops too. He's not just a... A makeup guy he can he can shoot a camera as well yeah it was really good Th- that was uh what really elevated this movie from mm-hmm. just being like a cool kind of sci-fi war movie was yeah the excellent effects they really they really took it to another level because i mean this this is from the mid 80s and it just it holds up so well you know yeah. we're in 2023 and i'm watching this movie and i'm like holy shit this there's, is really good yeah the, there's there's a couple of effect, like a couple of shots when the, the personnel carrier is dropping down in the atmosphere and coming into the the fake clouds or whatever mm-hmm. and i was like mm, well that looks a little rough yeah a couple of the flyer scenes were a little yeah weak. but everything else looks so good um you know, you would you could imagine this movie came out ten years after it did. Oh yeah. Um, the For other sure. thing, uh, Emma Porteous, the costume designer. All the costumes are incredible. The Marines' uniforms and their armor and everything, and the way they're all personalized. Oh yeah. Um, that all looks great. Uh, Ripley's rad Reebok high tops. <laughs> uh, I don't. You know, it's weird because Terminator had a sneaker moment too. Yeah. So I just like I wonder if James Cameron's a sneakerhead. Oh yeah, I bet uh, he's got some like Jordan ones that he wears around. <laughs> he probably because they there seems like you know we're only two movies into his his filmography, but there's always a like check these kicks out shot in yeah. in, in the movie. So I kind of want I wonder if he's into sneakers. That would be that would be interesting. Mm-hmm. All right, so that's all I've got for visuals. Me um, as well. Let's move on to audio. Yeah. Um, so the sound design and music for this movie was interesting to me because uh, I found a lot of the music and just general sound design to be uh, subtle. Yeah. It doesn't kick you in the face. It Sometimes you forget that it's even ha- anything's happening. Yeah. And it's extremely eerie. Yeah. Um, I really like the use of silence in this, which is important i think a lot of modern movies they just have to have music or sound effects or something all the time yeah but sometimes just silence is the creepiest thing in that moment yeah so james horner's score uh shifts tones a lot sometimes it's very monster movie like it's almost seems like like a godzilla movie sort of score uh, at heroic moments, it's like a John Williams adventure movie kind of score, like Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like in a lot of the military uh, sequences, it's it's just drums. You know, it, it gets into this real militaristic thing. And then at times, like you said, the score just drops out, and you just have like clicks and drips, mm-hmm. and just like the ambient sound of the spaceship or of the colony. Um, and it just builds so much tension. And when the score comes back in, shit's going off. Like aliens yeah. are attacking, guns are being fired, and it's like, and you're back in the action. Yeah, I, I called that out too. I really like the background soundscapes, mm-hmm. like the wind sound, yeah. uh, rain and dripping, the jet wash sounds. And I just like, I really like the, the way that these background noises are able to um, enhance things and kind of keep you on your toes. And then when the music comes back in, it's it's powerful, it's notable, and uh, it it's enhancing the scene. Yeah. Because you know you have to have dynamics. If yeah. it's, if you're always you know like a transformer movie where it's just always like, yeah. You know you're like okay we've had enough of that. I know it's hard because I I like to use I like to beat up on the transformers movies too because I think they're the the best example of everything I don't like. Yeah. And and it's really hard to get into why like I have such a visceral hatred for those movies, although I've watched all of them. Oh, <laughs> I, I stopped hate- after the first two. Yeah. Yeah, you should have. You're you're better off for some reason <laughs> some reason I just actually I still haven't seen Bumblebee, and it's supposed to be the the good one. Oh man! But I burned myself out watching the terrible ones. Well, now you have to do a full rewatch of the whole franchise in order to get yourself ready for Bumblebee. Bumblebee is a prequel. Oh, <laughs> perfect! 
<laughs> yeah. Um. Anyways, let's not talk about those terrible movies. Let's talk about this good one. Um. You know the thing that creeps me out is their 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 little sonar thing that they track movement oh, with. Oh yeah, yeah. Because it's always just clicking, and it. I just thought of it now. What it reminds me of is the the Geiger counter when you play Fallout. Oh yeah. And for so sure. that little click is just kind of always happening. And when there's not stuff attacking them, it's not clicking fast. Yeah. And so like, it's just a way. Sub- like it's subconsciously. It can as that you. as that clicks more and more, you start feeling more and more nervous. Just like when the Geiger counter starts clicking, and you're like, oh, "I'm getting radi- I'm getting irradiated." Yeah, yeah it's like it's, aliens are coming. It's definitely a an anxiety builder. Mm-hmm. It's it's pretty cool. I I think that the sound design here was, uh, it it was an effective part of storytelling. I oh think yeah, that was pretty cool. It's every everything is you know use all the use all the parts of the buffalo everything's doing its its job in this movie um, so you want to move on to themes and mo- motifs yeah for sure so the first the first theme is just the military industrial complex right like yeah. we always said they they call it a vietnam war movie um the first aliens is or alien ridley scott's is about corporate power yeah. this is about the that that sort of enmeshment of corporate interests and the american military Mm -hmm. um and you know i it's it's hidden it's a pretty scathing indictment of the way our world works hidden in a kick-ass action movie oh yeah for sure i i I called that out this is this has got um definitely has kind of like uh uh, military corpo fascism mm-hmm. versus, uh, you know, like the needs of people. Yeah, uh, this is this is all about crushing the little guy or, or using uh, ex- using spending, the little guy. Yeah, yeah, expending the little guy for the purpose of profit and all of that. So yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah, because we can't, we haven't really talked about that. Um, but so Burke, after Ripley tells them about the this alien ship that was on this planet where the where the eggs were. Burke uh, sends out a family basically to go and check that out. Yeah. Um, and you, and you, in the extended edition, we see this is Newt's family. Her parents are like scrappers and they're going to go out there and they're told that they can get whatever salvage from this ship that they, you know, if whatever they find, they can keep it. Yeah. And so they're going out there to find it and end up, you know, getting infected with aliens and then bringing it back to the colony. Um these these people are completely expendable to the to the corporation. Corporation doesn't care. Yeah. Um, and then the you know we hear the Marines talking about like is this going to be another bug hunt? We have no no idea how many planets of aliens they've gone and exterminated. Right. Oh uh, yeah. We're just taking it at face value that they're they're not intelligent life forms they're or animals. they're animals or whatever. Um, but it really just seems like they roll the Marines into planets, wipe out the, the indigenous life forms, and then colonize the planets. Sure, for sure. So another theme in this one is... Uh, like motherhood yep. and the nuclear family uh, mm-hmm. idea. So obviously we have the the queen alien with all her babies. There's a yeah. whole egg scene and mm-hmm. they, they Ripley burns all the eggs. And of course we have Ripley with Newt um, mm-hmm. and Newt at the end calls her mom. Yeah. Um, and we have uh, kind of that family vibe. You have Hicks becomes like the dad. Yeah. Um, and and I think that uh, there's a place in there for Bishop as like the self-sacrificing brother or uncle uh-huh. or something. Yeah. Um, and I think that that family and motherhood uh, central theme uh, is is interest. It's an interesting theme for an action horror military space flick. Yeah. And so this is you know again we're only two movies deep. This is a reoccurring occurring theme in all of his movies is mm-hmm. the sort of divine mother sarah connor sarah connor ripley um Nitiri or whatever an avatar i think that's her name yeah, zoe saldana's know. character um it's like i don't know i don't know anything about james cameron's family i imagine his mother must have been a pretty impressive lady because he's got a he's got a real thing for strong mothers like because that just comes up over and over or what again if he had no mother 
and this is like a fantasy thing. I, I don't think that's true. I think he had a. I think he had a mom. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. We'll we'll have to find this out. We need to learn more about James Cameron as as we deep yeah, dive him for sure. Yeah, because the the and it, they're, they're always warrior moms, right? Like that's the mom is always like the protector in, yeah, in his for, films. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're always they're always badasses, kind of a, yeah. a shield maiden vibe. Yeah. So in the in the extended cut, we discover that uh, that Ripley's daughter died. She because Ripley's been asleep for fifty seven years. Her daughter passed away, age sixty six. Um, so she she has no one to go back to. That's why she stays there on that space station because there's there's nothing on Earth waiting for her. Sure. Um, so it's another reason. Um, you know why she bonds so strongly with Newt is there's there's a, a dual surrogacy going on there. Yeah. Newt lost her mom and and Ripley lost her daughter. Yeah, and and I think that there's uh it, it's good acting. I think that mm-hmm. this is a this is well done. Um, there's a couple other like what I would call like sub themes, yeah. some th- sub threads. I like, uh, there's kind of a survival of the species thing going on yeah. where aliens are trying to survive and humanity is trying to survive. It's like, this is kind of like a survival of the fittest, um, biology, mm-hmm. uh, uh, in, in conflict. And then also I liked at the end, we get a full on Mecha versus Kaiju. <laughs> um, yeah, totally. And this whole, whole idea versus tech versus monster mm-hmm. is the whole movie. Yeah. It's, it's guns versus claws, um, biological weaponry, like chest bursters mm-hmm. versus flamethrowers and bombs. Uh, this, this whole back and forth of natural versus technology. Mm -hmm. I really, I really enjoy that theme. Yeah. The other, my last theme, uh, is even though this, this is not a Ridley Scott film, I do feel it, it continues his exploration of, uh, artificial intelligence and synthetic life, Mm -hmm. uh, that he started with the original alien continued on into Blade Runner. I think this keeps going with it with Bishop being, uh, like, Bishop doesn't want to be called an android. He's he sees himself as a synthetic human. Yeah, I and, really liked yeah. Bishop. That character was great. Yeah, Bishop is re- it's um and Ripley has to go over an arc with him, right? Because she's anti She's anti android in the first one. Yeah. yeah. Uh well, to be He's fair, a replicant. Ian <laughs> Ian Holm. Yeah, we'll see that's the whole in the I think it's in the special features of Prometheus they get into uh, the Way- Wayland versus Tyrell and the different theories of of artificial life, mm-hmm. um, because like the two the two men were colleagues and uh, one was a mentor to the other one, and then they went they went in two different directions. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess Wayland went for the the milk filled <laughs> variety, <laughs> yeah. uh, whereas the the Tyrell Corporation is is making synthet fully s- human synthetics. Yeah. Or replicants, <laughs> like you said. Uh, you want to get to performances? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. I think you can't. Uh, you have to start this section with Sigourney Weaver. You have to. She pretty much carries the movie on her back. The strength of her acting. She does drama really well. She does mm-hmm. action really well. I mean, she's the second woman to be featured as an action hero. <laughs> yeah. A- after Hunter, Ge- Hunter after, Games. After Jennifer Lawrence, yeah. Yeah. It's just <laughs> really good. It was good of her to pave the way yeah. for Sigourney Weaver. Yeah. She's a force of nature as Ripley. And, um, you know, notoriously, the Academy Awards hate genre movies. But she was nominated for uh, Best Actress for this role. Mm. Uh, she didn't win. She probably won to lost to a movie that was not notable. Yeah, one least. that we can't remember. Yeah. most likely because I I can't tell you which movie <laughs> it was. Um, and I really um I really appreciate the way uh they she portrays PTSD in this movie. Sure. Um, it's not it's not like cartoonish. It's not like a pity party. Um, but she's she's traumatized. And it stays with her. It does, but it doesn't. It's it's always a part of her, but it doesn't define her as a character. You know how like yeah. like sometimes sometimes you would. Uh, it's more tasteful than that. It's more. It feels very modern and nuanced. It feels like they're portraying PTSD in a way I don't think most people were doing in the eighties, um, and I just think that's really strong. Yeah, that I mean, I, I I definitely second all of that stuff, um, but 
moving on to other characters, mm-hmm. I'm with the Marines, just oh. as a squad. Okay. All of them. I love the squad. I think they're so perfect. Mm-hmm. Each and every one of them plays up a stereotype that's... Uh, it's a little overblown. They're yeah. they're a little caricature ish, but I uh, I really liked it. I mean, uh, Hicks of course is a favorite, yeah. and everybody has to like Hudson. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they, they're just the squad is such a great uh, group. They're for me, they were one of the most memorable parts of the movie. Is Def- the definitely so they got the whole squad they got there early and they did two weeks of boot camp with Hmm. each other so they trained and did drills and did all of this stuff like to basically get that get that camaraderie together uh and to be convincing um as a as a squad of marines and then um geez what's his name oh al matthews that plays apone he actually was a marine vietnam veteran um so him playing their sergeant he's relying heavily on his own military experience to you know to be that believable drill yeah, sergeant he was character. definitely believable yeah and like you know exactly who that guy is like from the moment he wakes up out of the out of the hypersleep thing and sticks his cigar in his mouth and gets up and starts like yelling out orders to everybody like mm-hmm. um like you said it's it's cartoonish um but I think a little overacting in that case is necessary because we need to learn who all these people are so fast. Yeah, this is definitely a show don't tell moment where yeah. they each kind of have a moment to show you who they are. Oh yeah, and then they move on. Who's Quick. who's your favorite Marine? You always ask me these car- questions. I wasn't uh, Dwayne expecting. Dwayne Hicks, I think. You think yeah, it's yeah. Hicks? It's uh, Michael Bean. Yeah. Yeah. So Hicks is interesting because superficially he's very similar to Kyle Reese. Yeah. But Kyle Reese in Terminator is all nervous energy, right? Like he's frantic and yelling all the time. And and Hicks is just cool as a cucumber. Yeah, he's just he's all business. He's, he's the guy who he done. falls asleep when they when they're in the drop ship, right? Yep. Like and they're going through all that. Everyone else is is like being kind of boisterous and like psyching themselves up. And he's like, This is this is my chance for a nap. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and it pays off as he's one of the only people to survive the movie. He doesn't freak out at all. Yeah. Which Hudson's Hudson's the opposite guy. I wasn't I wasn't sure if you were going to be a Hudson hater or not, because no, IRL, you hate the you hate that guy. I normally hate the Joker guy, but I was entertained by him. Mm -hmm. I think. I think it was really, he was fun and he, he, I mean, I was in the military. There's usually a fuck off guy. Yeah. And, um, I never was the fuck off guy. Uh, I mean, but I always was friends with them. Yeah. So Hudson, um, James Cameron called him the, the pressure relief valve of the Mm -hmm. movie. So basically he's their Jar Jar as (laughs) God, (laughs) that's terrible. But, um, so and I was calling him comic relief, and this is a, I, I like the pressure release as something different. Whereas basically the idea is tension is constantly building in the movie, and you need Hudson to say something ridiculous, or even to just, let a little steam out, or even just to complain blatantly, be like, uh-huh. "Oh my god, what <laughs> in the hell?" You're like, "Yeah, I was thinking that too." <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> when when uh, Ripley's like, "This little girl survived longer than that without any weapons or any training," he's like, "Why don't you put her in charge?" Then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it, it, it's yeah. funny. It's good. Uh, Hudson's probably my second favorite. Murphy. Yeah, and he is actually like he hasn't he's the tech guy right like yeah he does have a valuable area of expertise he's their computer dude yeah don't go figure the nerd is the guy <laughs> yeah the which weirdo. i guess that is also why he overcompensates and is over macho and everything mm-hmm. because he is the geek of of that squad yeah um yes how I about love, you what's your favorite marine uh, uh no i mean my favorite is um gosh why am I? I'm spacing on her name, Vasquez. Of course, um, I, I knew it was gonna be Vasquez. But Vasquez gets a little uncomfortable because that is not a Spanish woman. <laughs> that's no, that's a white lady. Yeah, Jeanette Goldstein. She's a white Jewish lady in in a lot of bronzer and. Mm-hmm. 2023, yeah. we don't do this anymore. Yeah, you don't. Do, you don't wear a brown face. <laughs> you would know. You would not cast. Uh, a white lady to play that part but i've gone my whole life 
think not knowing that that's who that was. <laughs> yeah, like I was looking up the cast and stuff, and now she runs like a like a um, uh, ladies bra store. Yeah, she in, makes for like plus size ladies and stuff. Yeah. In, in L.A. or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like she's now just like a well-known business owner yeah she's still i mean i don't know if she still acts but she's been in a lot of james cameron movies yeah because she's in terminator 2 and she's in titanic um and she's she's done a lot of work but yeah people kind of move out of acting sometimes at some point but yeah yeah, she's she's my favorite but hudson hudson is the most quotable he he (laughs) is but the hip mounted machine guns yeah with the with like it's like a gyro stabilizer probably like from a camera rig yeah it's a steady cam yeah that's exactly rig. what it looks like it looks like a steady cam rig with a machine gun on it and it's rad it is pretty <laughs> badass yeah you watch uh like the behind the scenes stuff how they so basically they took guns the stuff that gave them like the best muzzle flare and things like that mm-hmm. like guns that were the most theatrical and then clamped sci-fi bullshit onto them sure so it's it is it's pretty there's real guns inside of all of that stuff and it's pretty it's pretty cool it's all very well thought out and engineered like everything else yeah and they had to keep those pin those hip mounts on when they were taking breaks Mm because it was such an operation to put them on and take them off yeah so that was pretty funny and so um all these people for the most part uh because they filmed in the uk and because of the laws over there uh with their unions and everything before you can bring actors from the states to the uk you have to at least audition all the qualified people that are there so like basically all the american actors living in the uk had to be by union rules auditioned so they saw thousands of people to to cast this movie um but and they already knew who they wanted, right? For a lot of it, but a lot of them were people like Jeanette Goldstein was someone she was an American living in the UK. Oh, okay. And um she was at that time a female bodybuilder. Yeah. Which is why she's fucking jacked. Like cuz when we we meet her she's like doing like pull-ups, pull-ups like behind the head pull-ups and uh when they have her and Hudson have that exchange where he says hey, you ever been mistaken for a man? And she's no, have, have you? you? Yeah. yeah. It's that's just classic. So good. I love all the Marines. <laughs> yeah, they're really good in that movie. Um, let's see. We've so, already talked Lance Henriksen, but let's go a little more deeper on Bishop. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I really I really like Bishop. And I kept thinking about how Henriksen was supposed to play the Terminator. Yeah. And you really can kind of see he how finally, he was going. He go- finally got to play a Terminator. Yeah, how <laughs> he was going to do it. Like mm-hmm. his creepy Terminator, I think that's what oh, I was yeah. thinking. When he's crawling through that tunnel, and that just gives me the creeps so much. Like it's so claustrophobic and un- uncomfortable watching him wriggle like a worm through that tunnel. Yeah, Bishop is is a really strong character, and I mm-hmm. really like the acting, at yeah. the, especially at the end when he dies and he you know he, he makes well, it. sacrifices his body, I yeah. should say, um, uh, and he it's just. It's really an excellent performance. He's yeah. just really strong. I like he says not bad for a human. Yeah. <laughs> so so Lance Henriksen, he said uh, he comes from a, he had an abusive childhood and he said as a child he would always remind himself uh, that the abusive adults in his life he's like I'm going to outlive them. Mm-hmm. And and he said that he kind of thought of Bishop as being like a 12-year-old and and having that mentality so like when when the people are shitty with him or whatever he's just thinking he's like i'm gonna live forever and all these people are gonna die and and it's just like it gives it gives such a depth to his performance there's some um one of the one of the less memorable marines kind of comes up and starts talking to him and bishop turns around and just gives him the blank face because he didn't ask like he didn't address him like bishop can you get this for me or whatever he just started like talking to him like he's a a siri or whatever yeah yeah and bishop's and he's like bishop will you do this And (laughs) and it's like he's constantly uh you know asserting his synthetic humanity that he's not an appliance yeah he's like i'm not a machine i'm a person Mm -hmm. and yeah i think i think that was just really excellent and got to give it to henriksen he got food poisoning from the the milk and yogurt stuff that he has to spew out oh. because they had just cups of it 
sitting out. Oh, God. And it turns. And so shooting that scene and constantly, like, chugging this, like, turning milk and yogurt, uh, he got super sick. Jesus. Uh, they didn't even have, like, a cooler. Ugh. No. <laughs> so they, that's what they, they – they started giving him fresh milk the second day uh, because he got so sick from the, from the first day of shooting that yeah. scene. Uh, so, yeah. So he went through it. He went through it for this movie, and it, it really – it pays off. That's awesome. Uh, Carrie Hinn that plays Newt. Uh, I had it in my notes. Does Dave hate Newt or not? No, I like Newt. Newt she's is good. good. Yeah, good, she, good child actor. So she's not an actor at all. This is her one and only credit. She, oh wow! Um, they just found her. Her her dad was in the in the military, and he was he was stationed in in the UK. Um, they had auditioned a bunch of child actors for this part. And everyone had a background of shooting commercials. Uh-huh. So basically, all of the kids that they auditioned um, smiled at the camera after every time they delivered their lines. Because when you're doing a Mentos commercial yeah, or whatever, overacting everything. Yeah, that's how cheesy. you always smile after you say the tagline. And they were like, this can't work. This is a, this is a traumatized kid that's been living in vent tubes. It's just a flat affect. Yeah. And so they, they found this little girl who she had no acting experience. Um, and I think she does great in this. Yeah. And you can tell, like, her and Sigourney Weaver really, really bonded with each other. And it yeah. really comes through. See, yeah, it was really cool. I, I think that she did a great job. Not all child actors are terrible. Just most. <laughs> Just most. That's fairly true. Um, anyone else you want to highlight from the cast? Because no, it's, a, it's it, a big cast. I kept it sweet. I, I really just like, I, I mean, there are just a few characters that I were uh, I was really into, and I and I uh, called them out already. Did we say enough about Paul Reiser? Because he's like... He's a, a good heel. He's a great heel. And it just... Every time a new, like I call it like a onion layers of banal evil, um, mm-hmm. because it's like, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, Ripley, I made a mistake. I sent the colonists out to investigate the alien ship. I'm sorry. They're all dead. What do you want me yeah, to do? And then by them? the end of it, 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 when she's like, and you were going to, and you were going to kill all of everyone while they were in cryo. And then you would have the, you would get all the credit and uh, everybody would be dead and they couldn't refute your story. And he's like, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's like, look, he look. just turns from a shitty accountant all the way to just a sociopath. Yeah. Just completely will do anything to, to save the investment in this place. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, Ripley has, you know, the great line where she's like, I say we take off and nuke the place for more, but and and he's like hold on like there's millions of dollars of equipment here we can't just blow this up and this species is very valuable cuz he wa- he wants to use them uh for the bioweapons division like basically this would be another way to depopulate planets where they could just introduce these things and let them wipe everything out yeah for sure and, yeah. Uh, yeah he does a great job paul reiser probably unsung hero in this movie <laughs> oh totally well he's he's the third credit he's like oh is third he? third build he's he's one of the biggest stars of the movie um yeah i've got something about all the marines but we don't have to go through through each of them so do you want to do uh what worked for you and did you have a personal highlight okay um sure my personal highlight is really uh it's kind of a long sequence but it's the whole thing from the moment uh the Marines wake up out of cryo sleep mm-hmm. to when we drop into the planet, like that 20 minutes or so where we meet all the characters and they yeah. all meet each other. Um, it's like the forming of the fellowship of the rings. Yeah. And it's such a good show. Don't tell thing. We learn so much about, about their organization and what they do, how they operate mm-hmm. then. And they have to meet Ripley and Burke and integrate them into their tight knit unit. Um, we learn all about all their equipment and their guns and, and all of that stuff. And just, um, it's, it's just sort of like the most fun part of the movie. It's, yeah. it's, it's kind of like when it is just sci-fi fun and before it starts getting terrible, yeah, uh, for everybody, and so that that's my personal highlight. What about you? Uh, my personal highlight is uh, it's got to be the icon, the most iconic scene of the movie, mm-hmm. which is Ripley in loader suit battling the Queen Alien. Yeah, like, get it's, away from her, you bitch. Yeah, it's yeah. the most it's the most iconic scene in this movie. It's it's iconic. F- 
in in the film Pantheon. It's mm-hmm. amazing. Like I, I love that scene. It's so good. Considering it was done in the eighties, it is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that was my definitely my personal highlight. I thought it was awesome. Yeah, I don't think we we let's talk a little more about the power loader for just for a second because we didn't talk about it. What a feat of engineering this thing is. Yeah. So it ha- it's a thing that she doesn't pilot it by herself. There is a second person in it Inside. that's helping her puppeteer like, the thing because move the legs and yeah, the arms and everything because it's probably too big for her to to move on her own. Yeah. Um but it all like works. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, like I'm sure you it, couldn't really pick up something heavy with it, but those arms like they yeah, move. Yeah, cardboard box, no problem. Yeah, it, <laughs> a gray a gray painted cardboard box is supposed to be a heavy equipment. It it's really the engineering of that thing is is remarkable. Yeah. Um so what worked for you? What what? Um, I think that uh, probably one of the most important uh, things about this movie mm-hmm. is the main character Ripley being yeah. a, a a woman and anta- a protagonist. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the antagonist is a woman too, uh, yes. or <laughs> female. female at least. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> but the thing I like most about it is that it's not. They're not trying to be novel with it. They're mm-hmm. not trying to be like. Like Wonder Woman, let's you know, let's make this uh, yeah. all about the fact that she's a lady, strong female uh, lead TM. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not trying to do that. It's just she just is, mm-hmm. and uh, she's not she's not perfect. She's 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 got flaws. She's a real person, mm-hmm. and um, <clears throat> she's both kind but also um, badass. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, I just think that 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 really worked for me in this movie because you don't you don't stop to think about it until you think about it later. And it's like, okay, this is cool. I'm glad that this is a thing. And it has been a thing, Mm -hmm. um, you know, for like over 30 years. And so, and then the other thing, I think uh, what really worked for me was despite this being an amazing sci-fi movie where the xenomorphs look so good and Mm -hmm. the spaceships were really good and all of the alien sets were so cool with that Giger inspired art, all of that stuff is it's granted, it's awesome, but we kind of already have that from Alien. Right. What makes Aliens really cool is the interplay between the characters, like right. your personal highlight. The mm-hmm. uh, the moments between the Marines and Ripley and um, the kid and Bishop and the, it, it really is the drama, the acting, the uh, the writing, mm-hmm. uh, the the lines, and so. I think that really worked for me and it made this movie actually stand out and made it uh, better than just a flashy sci-fi flick uh, with cool effects. Because if someone's like describes a movie as a visual effects bonanza, you know, that's cool and all, but it's nothing if it doesn't have excellent acting. Yeah. You know, thinking of what you, what you were just saying, there's a moment when, uh, Hudson has got the schematics of the of the place, and they're all sitting over them, looking at it and kind of plotting out how to fortify themselves. And Newt is there; she's got like she's got the marine helmet on, mm-hmm. and she's kind of uh, tiptoeing up to try and, and like look at the screen. And Hicks just picks her up and sets her on the table yeah. so she can see, and no one says anything. But it's just this little. It's, it could even be an improv. It's just moment. a moment, yeah. yeah. But it just just shows how 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 bonded everyone has become with mm-hmm. each other, and they've become a little, like you said, like a family unit almost. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for me, what worked for me, the first thing I same thing as you, a shout out Sigourney Weaver, but really the whole ensemble is is incredible. There's no there's no weak links. Um, you know, there's some people that don't get as much shine as others, but yeah. everyone does a great job. My thing I went deepest on is the atmosphere of the movie. Mm. Um so sort of famously they fired the first uh cinematographer because he wanted to light the movie more brightly so that everything was visible Ooh, and that would have been a bad move yeah and james cameron is like like what are you doing it's like have you seen terminator yeah he's like <laughs> i want everything to be lit by the lights on their helmets and the guy's like that's crazy that's not how you light a movie and he's like that's how we're lighting this movie because we just want to see what they see uh, and that's how you make it immersive. And and, it was like Blair Witch before Blair Witch. Yeah, and so basically, the guy was just like, well, if that's how you want to light the movie, you need someone else. And it's like, okay, 
bye. <laughs> you know, we'll get someone else that'll do what we want. Um, but it pays off because the movie is it's so dark. You know, like I remember, you know, as a kid, especially as a comic book reading kid, I was always fascinated because I didn't really fully know what these aliens looked like. Mm-hmm. Like it was because they're hard to see and you just get glimpses of them. And like you don't ever get a moment like here's one out in the sun where you can look at all of the weird parts and stuff that's on them. Um and that makes them so much scarier because you can't when they go into places that they've cocooned in and everything, they're indistinguishable from the walls until they start moving. And I, I just think the atmosphere of this movie is incredible. And the sound design is also part of that. We talked about earlier the times when the score drops out and it's just clicks and drips and just weird space noises. Um, so moody. Um, and uh, finally, the the pacing. I've said it a few times, but I just think this movie is paced perfectly. Okay. Um, what didn't work for you? It was slow. It wasn't paced well. <laughs> you really? <laughs> you think it's too slow? Uh, I feel like um, uh, so. Like expectations are the thief of joy. Uh huh. The old saying. Um, And the expectation was that this was going to be a sci-fi action movie, Mm -hmm. and the first half of it wasn't. Okay. Uh, It it it, so there's a um I I like to use other people's words a lot. Uh, Brandon Sanderson has a thing where he says, um, early in your work in your Uh book, you need to um you need to deliver the the promise of the premise. Okay. Um, and so the premise here is aliens versus um versus humans Uh and um the whole idea is a promise that you'll get that and you don't get any of it for so long Mm, Um, and so it wasn't i know it was intentional james cameron said that was intentional Mm -hmm. but i didn't know that until afterward okay um and so while i was watching it because this is like over two hours long yeah well i was like you just the theatrical cut is like 215 so most of that yeah. 15 is credits Credits, yeah. yeah so i was like looking at my watch um not because i was bored but because i was like the fuck when's, when it, gonna, we, when's, when's it gonna it? kick off yeah um and, and so i don't think that that was necessarily bad but it um it does not it takes a long time to deliver it really mm. is a slow build it reminds me of stephen king's writing okay how it just builds and builds and builds um and so it was kind of like it was building toward a crescendo and it just took forever to get there. Okay. So I found that to be a little bit, um, a little bit off putting. I'm glad I uh, didn't tell you to watch the extended cut in, in my initial <laughs> watch. Yeah. And it's weird because I love Blade Runner and it's slow, but it's Blade Runner slower than it's, anything. The thing is, is that it's, it's promise is not that it's an action movie. It is oh. a noir investigative, uh, okay. uh, detective story. And so you, you buckle in and you're ready for a detective story. Okay. This has got alien. This has got Marines with machine yeah. guns and flamethrowers and aliens, and you yeah. don't get any of it for over an hour. Okay. Um, and so I didn't like that. And then that, that was the main thing. And then just nitpicky, mm-hmm. um, much like the Terminator, any scene that in, that had a flyer model, yeah, uh, was very clearly a model. Yeah, it was not. Whereas the vehicles looked real, like and well, every, yeah. everything else was like, legit. The APC is it's one of those. It's the machines that they they pull jets around on yeah. runways with, and then they just put armor all over it. But it's a real, it's a movable real vehicle. Yeah. yeah, the the flyers just kind of look like little things on strings, you know. Yeah, a little bit. Because they were. How about you? What didn't work? I really had very little to gripe about. Um, My one real complaint is that maybe I think the politics of the movie disappear a little bit behind how cool the Marines are. Like, I think that that this is a criticism of colonialism is sort of... they made them too likable? But they made... Well, because there's no reason for the Marines not to be, right? Because they're just as much tools of the of the industrial complex as the colonists are um they're just people that make it so that the whale and yutani corporation can make money from uninhabited planets 
they make the planets uninhabited so they can colonize them. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I just think I think how cool the Marines are outshines the the message of the movie a little bit. Um, That's an interesting criticism. Yeah. You made this other thing too cool. Yeah, because it's too easy to ignore the politics. It's the same thing with Star Wars. Star Wars has yeah. real progressive politics, but it's kind of hidden Darth behind Vader's laser swords. Cool. Yeah. yeah, it's like the the you know it's like the spoonful of sugar to help with the medicine there's maybe a little more sugar than you needed (laughs) there could have been a little more medicine but i like sugar man (laughs) (laughs) sugar is good yeah for sure sugar is delicious um final thoughts this is a toughie yeah because i i don't think it's perfect no i think it's very good i think it's in fact great um but i don't think it it lives in the pantheon of those those top tier Amaze Balls movies mm. that just blow me away. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and give this a four star rating, even though I it's, it would have been a four point fiver if we were doing that. I don't think it lives in the realm of five. Yeah, um, but it's very good. I, I I really enjoyed it. I think anybody this movie holds up to this very day. Yeah. Um, but I don't quite think it's there. Okay. How about you? I am going to go five on okay. it. And and the reason being, um, when I get to that, what didn't work for you, and I have to resort to, to things like that, like messaging and yeah. stuff like that, when there's nothing technical that I can find wrong with it, um, I think that's a five star movie because okay. if I'm really trying hard to come up with a criticism, and it's a, yeah, it's a sequel that also makes it hard for me to give it a five. Yeah. It's not original content, um, but yeah, I, I totally am good with that. A yeah. four and a five between us. Yeah, and so I that am, kind of puts our average right where it should be. I yeah, think. IMDb gives it a eight point four. Uh, Metacritic gives it an 84. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes gives it a 98, but I call that um, rose-tinted uh, backwards Myth. goggles because yeah. all these historical classics, people the only people reviewing old movies are enthusiasts. That's true. It's never a, critic, a critical person. So mm-hmm. I, I definitely think the Metacritic and the IMDb rating are are right there. It's 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 not quite perfect, but it's it's a little better than a four. So let's go ahead and take a quick break and then we'll come back with our ending segment. Welcome back divers. It's time for our final segment, the one where I ask Dave. What are you into right now? All right. I could give you guys um, some more Audible recommendations because mm-hmm. I've been through a fair number since, uh, I think like three books since we last uh, we last recorded. People like your book recommendations. Uh, I, I hear that. Yeah. Oh, I can do a quickie then because I got another one, a non-book. Um, so first of all, I listened to two more books in the Dark Tower series. Oh, man. So I'm done with number three. I'm giving it a rest. It's okay. kind of heavy. Uh-huh. Also... I only really like one of the Fellowship of the Rings. So <laughs> I only really like Roland. I, okay. I don't really like the other three characters very much. Um, so um, I definitely think if you're interested in Dark Tower, mm-hmm. you should check out The Gunslinger, the first one. Mm-hmm. And if you are really into it, like you think it's just the bee's knees, keep going. Okay. If you're at all neutral towards it, don't go any further. Don't go any further. It's done. Okay. It's, um, this, is, this seems very polarizing. Like some people I've talked to, this is their favorite like book series ever. It's, yeah. Uh, but other people are like, man, I just couldn't do it. Like I got a few into it and I just stopped. And so, yeah, I mean, it's... It, 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 Sometimes it'd be like that. Yeah, totally. Um, and then I read David Goggins' uh, new book, his follow-up to his first book, which was Can't Hurt Me. Mm-hmm. And this one call, is called Never Finished. Mm-hmm. And uh, it goes into some more stories from his past, but also some you know, some of the events that have occurred in his life since the last book where he, you know, he's doing like ultra marathoning and like the Moab 240, which is a 240-mile um 
uh, running event mm-hmm. and some other things, but it's, it, I wouldn't call it a self-help motivational, but it's more like an inspirational book. That's okay. the whole point. Like I, I listened to that and I just felt like I just couldn't stop. It was so good. Like David Goggins is, is a, is a hero of mine. And so that's worth, uh, worth checking out if you're interested in that sort of thing. Okay. So my real, what are you into right now is a music rep- recommendation. Oh, nice. Uh, Catatonia just put out a new album just okay. this month called Sky Devoid of Stars. This is, of course, Sweden's number one sad person export, <laughs> uh, according to one reviewer, which I thought was hilarious. Um, I love I love Catatonia. I have for years. Um, and I went and saw them. I've seen them twice in the last 12 months. So okay. uh, once in Vegas and then once uh, here. And it was pretty cool because when they played in Portland, they played uh, they played a couple of tracks off this album and they were preview because the mm. album wasn't out. And I was like, wow, these are really cool. They're kind of a little more proggy, a little less a little less doomy um are they a doom band or a melodic death metal or some sort of oh they're just they're considered gothic metal gothic if you're gonna pinpoint them but they have doom involved and uh uh and some sort of melodic death from their earlier days and um whatnot but these are the their catatonia are the kings of gothic metal mm. they're the top band along with like paradise lost and typo negative okay. um so yeah this album is really good they, they t- it takes proggy turns but it never fully goes down that rabbit hole mm-hmm. their guitar player blackheim he's really good and, and but he doesn't let it take over the songs are still um you know melancholic um uh, just like kind of some of them are anthems and some of them are dirges. Um, but it's all clean singing. There's no, they haven't done dirty, like dirty singings for many, many albums, mm-hmm. but it's really good. So this is extremely palatable for people who are not into extreme metal mm-hmm. because this isn't really very extreme except yeah. for extremely good. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very good album. I, I have liked all their releases as they come out, but okay. This is probably the best one they've done in like, I think they've got like 10 albums or something. This is probably the best one they've done in like three or four albums. Oh, cool. Um, it's it's a very good one. Uh, it's called Sky Devoid of Stars. I highly recommend checking it out. Even if you just go and listen to the single and see if you like the first, uh, you know, like it a little bit, then you can check out the whole album. Tribulation has a new single out too. I haven't listened oh, to yeah, it yet. I listened to that. It was pretty good. Okay, cool. I'm down. So what are you into right now? I really was racking my brain for this, and I couldn't come up with any uh, sort of standard what am I into right now. Mm-hmm. But I did go to an event that was something that, uh, unlike anything I had been to before, so I'm going to talk about this. And this, I went to something, me and, me and uh, Diver Ted actually came with me. We went to an event called Metal Mania. And oh. this was a combination heavy metal concert, backyard wrestling event oh. uh, at the Star Theater in Portland. And I've never been to a wrestling anything. Okay. Um, so this was a very new experience for me. And um, it's something else, man. Like, you know, wrestling is scripted. We don't have to, we can break kayfabe what? and say uh, these fights are not. Uh, they they're, they're not they're, real fights they're, they're, they're not, not real actually fights. mad they're not real fights but these are real stunts i saw a man while i was waiting to to get into the event because we got there a little bit late uh one of the matches came out into the street and right there on what is that fourth avenue or whatever uh someone got body slammed on the blacktop just out in the street oh uh, and um you know i don't care if you knew it was coming that hurt like oh, that yeah. was a real and like these impacts like a, like when you're right there by by the ring and people are jumping off the ropes and hitting like you feel it all through the crowd you feel those impacts um i never knew until watching this what an athletic physique i have until <laughs> <laughs> until i saw some of these underground wrestlers and i was like I mean, that guy's not in any better shape than me. He's a little younger and more willing to punish himself. There you go. We got a bunch of mankinds, a bunch of Mick Foley's out there. Yeah, there's beefy, beefy, beefy boys. There are some, there are some ripped guys too. But. Okay. So this was like, it was a collaboration uh, between Anarcho Pro Wrestling, which is a, like a small 
wrestling league here in Portland and Compton Mania out of Compton, California. So it was wrestlers from California and wrestlers from Portland uh, wrestling with each other. Nice. And, it, and it was um, it was pretty cool. It was a lot of fun. And um, and in between wrestling matches or depending on how you look at it, either in between bands, there was wrestling matches or in between wrestling matches, there was bands. Nice. Um, and so there was some some really good bands, uh, Oxygen Destroyers, a death metal band here from uh, from Portland that I'm a big fan of, and then there was uh, Undisputed World Champs, uh, who are a ska core band from Compton. <laughs> uh, they came up. I didn't actually stay for R.I.P. or Glitter Wizard, um, who were the headlining bands, and they've been cutting promos on each other basically leading up to this that was it was almost like the the two bands playing was a wrestling match in and of itself uh because they'd be like yeah they'd they'd be putting out videos where they talk trash about each other basically leading up to this show that's funny um I'm sure they were great, but it was just getting late, and I'm old. Uh, and oh, I yeah. saw the bands that came work to night. <laughs> yeah, I saw the bands I came to see, and and it was time to get out of there. But I will definitely go to more wrestling stuff because yeah, this I, was pretty cool. I'll give it a shot next time you're gonna go. Let me know. Yeah, we'll, we'll go see some out. backyard wrestling. Yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> All right, I uh, want to give them a call to action. Subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher, as well as YouTube, Spotify, and Audible. All of them, not just the one you prefer. <laughs> yes, yeah, subscribe on all of them. Go and do it on all of them, be, yeah. you know, because it helps us. And mm-hmm. if you're li- still listening after all this time, just do it. Yeah. Uh, don't forget to leave a review. A five star review costs you nothing, but means everything to us. New episodes of Nick and Dave Deep Dive the Meta drop on the first and fifteenth of every month, and you can find us on all social media platforms across the metaverse as at Deep Dive the Meta. We are on Mastodon with all those Linux nerds. Mm. We're on Hive when it's working, and we're on Vero when we remember it exists. Well, I guess this is really goodbye. Don't say goodbye. Say good journey. <laughs> <laughs>